Chapter 27, Thunder Cave. The wheels of the Land Rover s slipped and spun over the muddy savanna. Twice we got stuck and I had to get out and push. My father sat in the back with his injured leg stretched out trying to keep it stabilized, but every time we hit a bump he winced in pain and by the time we got to, to camp he was in pretty bad shape. I expected to see my father's assistant Gunzu, Nigunzu, when we drove up, but the camp looked abandoned. Where is Nigunzu? I asked. Gone, my father said. Before I left, I told him to wait until I was at Donovan's camp. Then go and get help. It's going to be a while, though, because he was on foot. So Pete and I helped him get out of the back of the Land Rover. We've got to get in touch with the anti poaching unit, my father said. But the radio signals are jammed, I said. I don't think so. My guess is that Donovan is on the move. He knows where we're going to be after him, and he'll want to get the ivory out of the country as fast as he can. We helped him over to the radio, and he began trying to reach the authorities. After 25 minutes, a man came to the radio, on the radio. The signal was weak, and we could barely hear him over the static. But he said that he could hear us just fine. My father explained what had happened. Where do you think the ivory is? Over, the man on the radio asked. I don't know where it is, my father said impatiently. Donovan was heading south. I suspect that he has the ivory cached near the Tanzanian border. We have a transmitter on his plane. If you send a plane, we can start flying around and maybe we'll get lucky. Over. We will send an airplane, the man said. Is there anything else? Over. No, just hurry or... Wait a second, I interrupted. My father looked at me questionably. I held up my hand for the microphone and he gave it to me. My father's hurt, I said. He's been shot in the leg and needs medical assistance. Over. I'll be fine, Jake. I ignored, I ignored him. Did you copy that? Yes, the man said. Your father has been shot and needs medical assistance. We will send an air ambulance. Anything else? Over. I looked at my father and he shook his head. No, I said, over and out. There was nothing we could do until help arrived. I convinced my father to lie down and rest in his tent. Then Sapit and I ate and Sapit fell asleep. I should have been tired, but I wasn't. I borrowed some of my father's clothes and walked to a small stream about a mile from camp, the bathing hole, my father called it. The stream was already swollen with water from the long rains, which were still pouring down. I stripped down and took a bath, washing away several days of sweat and dirt, and put my father's clothes on. They were too big for me, but at least they were clean. Just as I was slipping on my tennis shoes, a small airplane passed low overhead and came in for a landing near the camp. I started to jog back. Halfway there, I saw a man get out of the plane and walk to my father's tent. When I stepped into the tent, the man stopped, talking, and looked at me. He was tall, lean, and muscular, like a Maasai, but instead of traditional clothing, he wore a crisp khaki uniform and carried a holstered pistol on his hip. My father lay on the cot with his head propped on his elbow. Galisho, he said. This is my son, Jake. Galisho smiled and then turned back to my father. The reason I'm alone is that when the call came in, I was the only one there, and you know, priorities have changed. Most of our units are to the north. The drought is very bad there, and people are killing many animals for food. He glanced outside the tent. This rain should help. Well, my father said, under the circumstances, you can't blame them for poaching. This Donovan character is another story, though. I wondered where Sapit was. I hadn't seen him when I came into camp. Why didn't you tell us about this problem earlier? Galicio asked. I couldn't get through, my father said. They jammed the radio, and I was afraid to leave because I thought they'd move in on the elephants. I was even afraid to say to send Nagunzu out of fear they'd kill him. We rarely saw them, but we knew they were watching us. The only thing we could do was try to lead them away from the elephants. Galicio nodded and said, Tell me about this man. My father told him everything he knew about Donovan's poaching operation. When he finished, Galicio said that he thought he knew who Donovan was. He may have been here several years ago during the last drought. It was very profitable for him. 
We didn't know about it until after he had left the country. Well, he came back for seconds, my father said disgustedly, and I don't think you'll be able to take him on your own. I won't be alone, Galicio said, and took a map out of his back pocket and spread it out on the floor below my father's cot. Three places along the Tanzanian border were marked in red. We have military patrols in each of these locations. It seems likely that he is near one of these sites because they're all good roads for transporting the ivory out of the country. But we don't know which one, and areas are large. My father looked at the map for a few moments, then pointed and said, I'd start at Lake Neutron. Donovan didn't have much fuel where he took off. I don't think he could have reached other places. And the transmitter, Felicia asked, you should be able to pick up the signal from at least 10 miles away. You won't be able to come with me, Felicia asked. My father pointed to his leg. I'm afraid not. I can't track and fly at the same time, Galicio said. I'll have to wait for someone to help. There's no time for that, my father interrupted. Jake knows how to use the equipment. He'll go with you. Galicio looked, glanced at me, then back at my father and said, But he's just a boy. He put the damn transmitter on Donovan's airplane, my father said angrily. You don't have any choice. But a boy, Galicio started to protest when Sapit stepped into the tent. A voice behind us said, There are no boys here. We all turned. And who are you? Galicio asked. Sapit didn't answer. Galicio noticed the necklace and the snake amulet around his neck. He stared at them for a long time. Jacob is no longer a boy, Sapit said. And those? Are those the Ekendang? he asked. Sapit nodded. Galicio glanced at me, then looked back at Sapit and said quietly, all right. That settles it then, my father said. But what about you? I asked him. I wanted to make sure that he got to the hospital. I'll be fine, he said. I'm sure the air ambulance will be here soon. I'll stay with your father, said Pete added. I looked at Galicio and said, I guess we can go then. I mounted the antenna under the left wing of the airplane, then climbed into the cockpit next to Galicio. When we were airborne, I turned the receiver on and slipped the headphones over my ears and began listening for the signal. It took us 45 minutes to reach Lake Natron area. I motioned for Galicio to start circling and closed my eyes as I could listen to the signal without being distracted by what I saw outside. But I didn't hear it. We flew a few miles away and started circling again. Still, no signal. It was going to be dark in a couple of hours, and I was getting worried. If we didn't find Donovan before sunset, we'd have to wait until the next morning, and by then he could have the ivory out of the country. Perhaps they're not here, Galicio said. Or maybe Donovan's discovered the receiver and smashed it, I thought. Let's move a few miles east, I said. Galicio banked the airplane and headed east. I waited 10 minutes, then tapped him on the shoulder and motioned for him to start circling again. About halfway through the loop, I heard what I thought was a very faint beep. I had Galicia repeat the maneuver, and I heard the beep again. I think I've got a signal, I said. Galicia smiled. Where? Go ahead, go around again. I wanted to be certain of the direction, so this time I looked out the window while I listened. When I heard the beep, I picked up the landmark in the distance. I pointed through the windshield. Head towards that hill. The hill was about 20 miles away. The closer we got to it, the stronger the signal. I think we've got him, I said. He has to be near that hill. Good, Galicio said. Then turn the airplane sharply in the opposite direction. What are you doing, I protested. I said they're somewhere near that hill. We need to get help. Can't you use your radio and warn them that we're coming? He was right, of course. Donovan would n no doubt be monitoring all the radio traffic in the area. One of the military patrols is close by, he continued. We'll land and talk to them, and we'll all go in together. Twenty minutes later, we spotted the military patrol. Galicia flew directly over the, biv the bivouac, wagging his wings, then came in for a landing on a nearby road. What's military doing out here, I asked. Patrolling the border, Galicio answered. There are a lot of refugees coming in from Tanzania. The military is supposed to stop them. But there are too many of them. 
We think Donovan used the confusion to smuggle the ivory out of the country the last time he was here. But this time, because of you, we may capture him. At least his airplane, I said. Galicia laughed. Oh, I don't think he'll be too far from his airplane. A man picked us up in a Land Rover and drove us around the, to the camp. There were at least 50 men milling around, talking and laughing. Some of them wore rain ponchos over their camouflage fatigues and flask vests. Several transport trucks were parked in, at the edge of the camp, as well as, as three large hot helicopters. Galicio asked to see the captain, and we were told that he would be available soon. While we were waiting, they offered us some food. Pretty soon, the captain came over, and Galicio began explaining the situation to him in Swahili. He showed Donovan's approximate location on the map, and the captain called several men over to take a look. When they finished talking, the captain walked to the center of the camp and called the men around him. He spoke to them for a few minutes. Then they dispersed quickly. The soldiers grabbed their rifles. Some of them ran to helicopters, while others ran to the trucks. Within minutes, the loaded trucks were moving down the road towards Lake Natron. <clears throat> I asked Galicia what was going on. They are going to help us, he said. I looked up at the darkening sky. Will there be time? The captain thinks so, Galicia said. The trucks are getting a head start. The helicopters will follow soon. You and I will pinpoint Donovan's location and the helicopters will go in. The captain came over and said something to Galicia, then turned and walked briskly away. We are going... We are to go in our to our airplane. I followed him to the Rand Rover. I, a loud whining sound came from the helicopters, and the rotors began to turn slowly. We drove to the airplane. Ten minutes later, we were flying towards Lake Natron. The helicopters were somewhere behind us. They wouldn't attack until they were sure we had found the camp. I started listening for the signals as soon as I saw the hill. Beep. Beep, beep. The signal was so strong I had to turn the volume down. It must be close by, I yelled to Glisho. He slowed the airplane and both of us concentrated on spotting the camp in the evening light. There, Glisho pointed. In front of us was a large clearing. We saw a half a dozen trucks and several men carrying elephant tusks. A short runway parallel to the clearing and at the very end of it sat Donovan's airplane. Galicia got on the radio and told the helicopters. He swung the airplane around and passed over the camp again. The men below were running now. Trucks were beginning to move. They're getting away, I said. Galicia shook his head and pointed to his side of the airplane. The helicopters appeared simultaneously from three different directions. They hovered... <clears throat> They hovered over the ground like dragonflies as soldiers jumped from the open doors. In the gray light, we saw the muzzle flashes of rifles being fired. A moving truck veered sharply to the right and ran into a tree. I looked out my side and saw a man running towards the air airplane on the runway. Donovan, I, it, I shouted. It had to be him. Galicio instantly cut the power and pushed the stick all the way forward. The nose dropped, and we lost several hundred feet of altitude in seconds. As we plummeted down, he brought the airplane around sharply to the opposite end of the runway and pulled on full flaps. The airplane seemed to hover for a second, then bounced on the runway.